Hi, my name is Father Bill Dine. I'm a pastor in the Diocese of La Crosse, and I also work in the Tribunal as an auditor. In my work, I am privileged to assist with the many issues of relationships and marriage. Our Church is correct in holding out the beauty of marriage and how it is the cornerstone of society. God's plan that unfolds in marriage is a blessing to the couple, to the Church, and to the world. I am privileged as a pastor to assist many couples in their preparations for marriage and also to counsel those who struggle to attain the beauty of God's intent for married life. It is always a joy to see two people dedicated to making a marriage more fruitful and loving. My work in the tribunal is equally as important because as human beings we often make mistakes and unfortunately this can happen in marriage as well. The annulment process is a process of justice that allows the Church to hold up the beauty and dignity of marriage while also acknowledging that because of our human weaknesses, we may have lacked some essential aspect needed to enter into God's definition of married life. There are many questions about annulments and their place in the Church. To help people understand this process a little more, Members of the tribunal often go out to parishes to conduct workshops and answer questions. Monsignor Hunt, our judicial vicar, also is sometimes invited to a parish to take the masses on a particular weekend to preach on marriage and the annulment process. Recently, a camera crew accompanied him to Immaculate Conception in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and captured one such session. I encourage you to listen and to learn more about what makes marriage and the need for the annulment process. I can see on the face of many of you, who is that guy anyway? <laughs> I'm Monsignor Hunt, and I'm here because your pastor has invited me to come by on this particular weekend. And uh, more than that, your pastor, being a man who takes charge of his situation, has told me what I am to speak about. And uh, it's very interesting that we just finished this beautiful gospel, which is preparing us for Easter Sunday when the one who raised the dead man to life will be the one who comes forth from the dead, from the tomb by himself. Lazarus, brought back to life by the mercy and the goodness and the power of Jesus. Now, my topic, with your pastor's desire, is to speak about annulments. I have been associated with the marriage tribunal in La Crosse for over for 30 years. And during that time, it has come to me that, you know, this annulment thing is a healing mission of the church by which those who have been affected adversely spiritually by a divorce and probably by a remarriage while that first marriage is still standing there in this wise they've almost become what we would have to call the dead the Catholic person because they cannot share in the wondrous gift of the Holy Eucharist and so the application or the petition for annulment represents the person calling out, Lord, hear me, and bring me out of this place of darkness in which I am as the person married without being able to participate anymore in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. So, and you know, there are those who in our days say, I don't know if I want to hear about this topic because I think all too many people are getting annulments these days. Friends, let me tell you, I'm at the exact opposite end of that particular argument. My argument is, my thought is, that far too few people are getting annulments. Can you imagine this, that there are about 30,000 possible petitions for annulment in our diocese? How many petitions do you think we're going to get this coming, this year? If we are lucky, of that 30,000 possible petitions, we will see about 150. Now, you know why this is something of a tragedy? 
So many of these people are getting married again and they're leaving behind the church of their grandparents and their parents, leaving behind the wondrous, gorgeous, beautiful mystery which is our Catholic Church. And so simple it would have been for many to at least make a petition to have the healing of spirit that an annulment can bring. Now there's all manner of misinformation or no information out there about this particular topic. So I'm going to go across, go over some of the things that seem to be the prime topics for conversation at the barbershop or the bar room or the backyard barbecue. And let me start this way by saying annulment is not a Catholic word for divorce. Divorce is the word we use when two people who have decided they cannot be in the same county together, much less in the same house, and they go off to a civil magistrate, they go off to a judge, and the judge says, you know, with the authority vested in me by the state, I'm going to declare that you people can go back out into the world as single folks. Now, there's a marriage standing here. Of course, the judge doesn't say that. There is a marriage standing there, but here are two folks who have decided they will not live that marriage anymore, and they get the license of the judge to go out and act like single folks, which in reality, they are not. That's divorce. Annulment. Annulment says there really wasn't a marriage. Now, I can feel it in the air, some folks thinking, hey, I know people who were married 17 years and have three kids, or had three kids, and they got a divorce, and now one or the other is going to go off to the marriage tribunal with a petition for a declaration of nullity. Now, are you going to tell me that after 17 years and three kids, there could be a declaration of nullity? Yes. How can you do that? Well, let me ask this. Raise your hand if you know. What makes marriage? Let me clear the air by saying marriage is not made by a couple of people consenting to get together on a Saturday afternoon in church with a few or many witnesses, big wedding party, lots of money spent. That doesn't make marriage. Marriage, here's a real shocker, is not made by love. What does make marriage? Marriage is made in only one way. Listen closely. It's made by proper marital, marital consent. Proper marital consent is very, very different from consent to a wedding. Okay, proper marital consent. What makes it proper marital consent? Because of the content. The content is a foursome. The two people must commit to living together until one dies. They must commit to a relationship that is open to children. They must commit to a relationship that will be lived in sexual fidelity, one to the other. And they must commit, both of them, each of them, to the project of making marriage a good, a good life experience for their partner. I'll bet some of you are saying, doesn't everybody do that? Well, let me assure you, on a Saturday afternoon in June, we'll pick that because this Lenten season there aren't that many weddings, but on a Saturday afternoon in June, you can absolutely bet the week's salary that a couple in our diocese got married and one or the other or both 
have decided there will be no children. Or one or the other or both will say, you know, if things really get tough and we're no longer happy, we can always get a divorce. And this is the one that really gets me, and I've seen it repeatedly in the work of the marriage tribunal. During this courtship, there's been a, a, another boyfriend or a girlfriend around the edges. And after four or five months, the one that was on the edges is now between the sheets. Anybody here want to say that those people were committed to fidelity? So, we have people who are saying there's not going to be any children, or people who are saying we can always get a divorce. They went off on that particular Saturday afternoon to a wondrous, wondrous wedding reception in the evening. Guess what it was? A wonderful party. But it wasn't about a marriage, because none happened. The content of the consent was invalid, and therefore, when that marriage breaks up, when that story is brought to us, we will look at the content of the consent and say, a declaration of nullity will be, will be granted in this instance. People say annul annulment is something of a tragedy for the kids. Stop, folks. It's not the annulment that's the tragedy. Divorce, that's the tragedy. Divorce is that which probably impoverishes everyone. Divorce is that which is preceded by the kids seeing all kinds of things and hearing all kinds of things between mother and dad that they don't ever want to see and they run off and hide when mother and dad are going at it. That's the tragedy. Divorce is that which gets the kids at one place one weekend and another place another weekend and this place for this Christmas and this place for this Easter. That's the tragedy. And by the way, and very importantly, because this is one of those things that's so vastly misunderstood, annulment has nothing, nothing to do with the legitimacy of the kids. Legitimacy follows on any marriage that gets on the book of the Register of Deeds in the county in which the marriage happened. Every child born of that marriage is forever and ever and ever legitimate, no matter what happens to the marriage in the course of time. An annulment absolutely doesn't touch legitimacy of the kids. Annulment, not a tragedy for the kids, but is a wonderful, wonderful healing moment for the person who makes that petition. You see, we have someone who is spiritually wounded, spiritually sick, spiritually weak. How about this play on words? Spiritually an invalid because of an invalid marriage. So that person makes a petition and there are those who say, it's nothing more than a big, fat, money-making thing for the church. Well, it's late morning now. We can do this heavy-duty mathematics. Think on this. Our budget is about $180,000 a year. If we are lucky, we will take in $50,000. $180,000 is going out. $50,000 is coming in. Only the federal government would call that a money-making project. <laughs> it is a huge, huge leaker of money. So why do we do it? Because it's the healing mission of the church. People say, I'm not going to do it because it costs me individually too much. Well, we ask. Catch that word? We ask 
$400 for a project that costs over $1,200 to accomplish. And I said, we ask. And someone says, well, I can't possibly pay 400 bucks. How much can you pay? We more than a few times get negotiated down to zero. And it's not a browbeating kind of negotiation. We listen to the projects or the problems rather of the folk who is in front of us and respond to it. Why do you do something that costs $1,200 and more for nothing? Because it's part of the healing mission of the church. Some people say I'm not going to do it because it takes too long. Well, I can assure you, friends, if there would be somebody in this church today who would go to Father Moret sometime this week or even next week, because, you know, well, Father, I think I should try to take care of this thing. I, right now, I'm not even thinking of getting married again, but who knows? I might someday. Then I have to take care of this. So, why, so let's say that kind of person comes to Father, and the forms are filled out. We get those forms in the next 12 or 14 days. I can assure you, friends, before the leaves turn in the fall, that is, if the snow ever goes away and the leaves turn, uh, before the leaves turn in the fall, that case will be finished. And it's not as though we were just rushing to get it done. It takes about that long. And the reason it takes that long is because it's a first come, first serve kind of operation. And it occurs to me to say one thing about falling just a bit out of the sequence here. This uh, business of someone uh, getting the case for nothing. It's not going to affect the speed of the process nor the kind of decision that's granted. I return to the old theme. Why this? Why no difference? It's part of the healing mission of the church. Would it surprise many to know that uh, we have a good number of our cases deal with non-Catholic marriages? After the last Mass, a person came up to me and said, you said something that exactly read my mind when I said, I'll bet there are folks here who don't even recognize that the church recognizes marriages of the Lutheran or the Methodist or the Muslim or whatever. What, where did we start? What makes marriage? Proper marital consent. So for two people who are free to marry, and following the laws of the state which make it necessary for a valid union, or following the church's rules if they might apply to them, if those two people express marital consent, whether they're Methodist or Lutheran or Presbyterian or Baptist or whatever, it's presumed to be a valid marriage. And so, take this case. It's Sue and Fred who are Lutherans and they got married and two and a half years later, Sue and Fred are divorced. Two, year, two years after that, Fred is going with Mary who's a Catholic. And uh, Sue, or Fred is uh, much interested in Mary and she's not uninterested in him, but one day she says, you know, Fred, we got to cool it. Ain't no way that I can marry you because you have been married, and you're not free to marry anyone anywhere in the world in any circumstance because, you know, this business of one marriage and one per, uh, one ma that's God's law, not the church's law. 
But, Mary says, would you consider going with me to my pastor? And would you consider having your case taken care, looked at by the Catholic Marriage Tribunal? And because Frank is interested in Mary, not particularly overwhelmingly pleased by all of this, but Mary moves him. And so, okay, let's do it. And so that's how we get the wedding of the Lutheran person at our tribunal. And guess what, folks? When that case comes in, we hardly notice that it's a Lutheran person. Why? Not interested in the religion, are we? We're interested in one thing. Was this a valid marriage? between two people who were free to marry. So, some of the things that are talked about in very, in different places where a lot of misinformation is passed around, and if none of this has anything uh, to do with you, particularly this morning, how about some neighbor? How about some family, extended family, son, daughter? Or we had one situation where the daughter said to dad, get your marriage situation fixed up. Guess what? Four days later, dad was at the marriage tribunal getting the marriage situation fixed up. I want to finish today, friends, with saying something to all of you who are sitting here, married couples, sitting here with your children. Do you have any idea how hugely important you are to our nation, to our community, to our church? The pillar of society is the married couple and their secure family life. You know, we live in an age in which everything is discussed. And at the present moment, one thing that is discussed over and over again with a superior arrogance, and that is we're going to reframe and reformulate and rethink the whole marriage situation. Dear friends, there is an avalanche of secular thinking and pagan thinking coming at you like we have not experienced in our lifetime, but it's here. Get used to it. And get used to fighting against it. Because in our day, arrogance and wrong thinking can very easily triumph because of the volume of the microphone with which those kinds of thoughts are expressed. Friends, you've got to pray daily that you see your vocation as something that is precious, something that is good, and something that must be lived to its richest fullness for the good of the, for your own good, for the good of the nation, for the good of the church, for the good of the community, for the good of your children, for an ending list of goods, because almost everything of society pivots around the individual family unit. Dear friends, if you don't do your work as a married person, The new dark age that is coming upon us will get very dark very soon. You must be serious about living the richness which is yours as the married couple. You know, the church doesn't need 
And the world doesn't need another great book or another great speaker or another great program. The church needs that which you and I were commissioned to be at our baptism. What was that? We were called to be saints. And you know what, friends? The world would be immensely changed if we responded to our baptismal call to be a saint. And one last sobering thought. Guess what? To be a saint is not an option. It's an imperative because only saints get to heaven. Thank you for listening to Monsignor Hunt's message. There's almost no one whose life is not touched by the sadness and hurt of divorce. The couple, their children, parents and siblings, as well as friends and colleagues, the communities of faith and the organizations that individuals belong to are all affected when a couple gives up on a marital relationship. The tribunal sits waiting to assist those hurt by the end of such a relationship with a search for truth that can often bring healing. If you or someone you know and love has experienced this pain and are trying to move on and participate fully in the life of the church and in the life of faith, I encourage you to walk with them in starting the annulment process. The typical way this is done is to approach a local pastor in a parish you are attending or maybe where a loved one attends. These pastors sit ready to assist you in many different ways and can help you with the initial paperwork that will begin the annulment process. If you are not connected to a church, the tribunal staff in the Diocese of La Crosse also stands ready to assist you. You can contact us at our telephone number 608-788-7700 and ask for the tribunal or me email us at tribunal at dioceseoflacrosse.org or d-i-o-l-c dot org. There are a few things as beautiful as a healthy marriage. But our human weakness or our failures should not keep us away from the grace found in our faith or in the church. May the Holy Family watch over you and your families, giving you the strength to address the challenges that you face. May God bless and keep each of you in his care.